Have you ever wondered where you really stand with God? Are you overcome with feelings of guilt because of things you've done wrong? Are you tired of religion that focuses on rules that you can't keep? Have we got good news for you? It's time to listen in on some casual conversation with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski and discover what true freedom is all about. This is Growing in Grace. Thanks for tuning in again to Growing in Grace. My name is Joel Brzezinski, along with me, Mike Kapler, and we're uh, thanking you, as always, for tuning in. We're in the middle of a series, uh, something that we haven't done a whole lot of on the podcast. You know, a lot of times we'll do maybe one or two podcasts because the first podcast, we didn't have enough time to get everything in, so we'll carry it into another one or maybe even a third one. This one, we knew that there was a lot to talk about, so we're calling it a series on the subject of the Lord's Prayer. So we'll be uh, doing a little bit of recapping today and then moving on to uh, what we have in store today. So on the other side of the glass right there, it's Mike Kapler. And how you doing? <laughs> the other side of the glass. <laughs> oh, yeah. And down the street and down another street and then down another street about five miles away. There he, there he is. <laughs> well, it's, I've got glass here by me, so you're right. <laughs> Not disagreeing. Are you on the other side of that glass, though? That's because that's what I defensive, aren't you? About what what you believe. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Hey, uh, real quick recap here, because obviously we are breaking this off into chunks, and there's pros and cons to doing a series. You know, over the years, Joel, we haven't done a lot of series here on the on the Growing in Grace podcast. We did one pretty long one um, a year or so ago with why Jesus taught two covenants. Otherwise. They've been pretty short or fairly minimal, and we just kind of take it week by week here. Now, sometimes we follow a thread that goes from week to week, and and until we complete our thoughts, then we move on. But He's this, uh, this is definitely I a series said. with the Lord's Prayer. And the the downside <laughs> of this is, you if, if you're only that. catching one or two podcasts, and and not all of them, because there there could be a, at least a handful of these or more by the time we're done. I don't even know how many it's going to be, Joel, but whatever it is, whatever the, the amount of podcasts that we're doing on, on the Lord's Prayer, it, it's kind of important for those uh, who are listening to try to put them all together as much as possible. I don't mean you have to sit there and listen to them all at once, but you have to keep everything in, in perspective, which is not an easy thing to do, but this gives us an opportunity to go beyond the headlines, so to speak. And dig a little deeper in, in order to, to bring some clarification, hopefully turn on some light bulbs that weren't on before, and help you connect to the bigger picture of an old covenant that Jesus was largely ministering under to the Jewish people who were under the law, uh, and then a new covenant that would be coming and would be made available to all, both Jew and Gentile. And what is going on here during the Sermon on the Mount, right here in the middle of the sermon, Matthew 6, Jesus continues to minister this message to his disciples and those followers that were there listening to him. As Jesus had previously told them, the righteousness of God was basically out of their reach because they couldn't live perfectly by the works of the law. And so now Luke recorded it that the disciples asked Jesus, well, wow, maybe, maybe you better teach us to pray the way that John's disciples taught him to pray. And so Jesus is instructing these people under the law how they should pray at that time. Why? Because they had just been told they were in a hopeless position under the law and they need another answer. Jesus, of course, would be that answer. So leading into the prayer, we had just mentioned briefly that Jesus said, you don't have to be like the Gentiles. We are Gentiles if we haven't been born of the Jewish race. So we know Jesus, and that's an important point to get. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jesus wasn't speaking to non-Jewish people during this time. He just wasn't. And so he's telling them, don't be like the Gentiles. They repeat things over and over again, empty phrases, meaningless conversation. It's going to go nowhere. Don't be like that. Pray along these lines. One thing to point out about that, this example of how to pray that Jesus was providing for them, it would have had meaning for those under the law to whom he was speaking prior to the cross. But for us who are under a new covenant, There's no reason for us to be repeating these phrases because they now echo a certain emptiness because why? Jesus, and we'll talk more about this, but because Jesus fulfilled the prayer, what the prayer was seeking, Jesus finished. It's my experience, Joel, regardless of whatever words Christian use, we Christians, when when we pray, whether it's the Lord's Prayer or, or on our own. It seems to me, it's my observation, that we are frequently asking and seeking for what God has already given. And and I think that's what's going on here with the prayer is 
this re religious tradition of repeating it, a memorized script, repeating a prayer that God has already provided us the answers for through Jesus Christ. Yeah, someone had asked us about this on the on the very first podcast in this series. Uh, you know, what do we mean by meaningless repetition and, and all that? And one of the answers I gave was, imagine that uh, I want to go to Disneyland. And so I ask, can I please have a trip to Disneyland? Now, this is a real simple example, and not all examples are perfect, but just follow me on this. So I ask for a trip to Disneyland. And then I'm granted that trip to Disneyland. So I am sitting there at the top of a roller coaster at Disneyland, enjoying my time there. And I say, can I please have a trip to Disneyland? <laughs> it sounds silly, but I'm asking for what has already been given to me. And that's the same thing with a lot of these things here in the Lord's Prayer. At the time when, this, when Jesus taught his disciples this prayer, at the time, it had meaning. It was meaningful because he was telling them to ask for certain things. He was telling them to present requests to God, so to speak. And then uh, what would happen was that with Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, these things would be fulfilled. We talked, of course, about your kingdom come, your will be done, how the will of God was Jesus Christ. He wasn't talking about, you know, what's your will in this issue in my life? What's your will in that issue in my life? But the will of God found in Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, was that Jesus Christ would come and be the sacrifice for our sin, and, and so on and so forth. And so, really, when we're praying this prayer today, the Lord's Prayer, we're really asking God for what he's already done, and it's just kind of silly to do that. And so uh, that kind of answers that question, hopefully, for some people. And it may take you a little while to get that and to understand that. If you were raised, as I was, praying this prayer in church every week, it is a bit of a traditional mold that needs to be broken. And I certainly understand and sympathize with you and emphasize, because I certainly understand, I've done this all my life. You're telling me that I've been wrong. You're telling me that I shouldn't be doing this. And so, you know, it, we're just trying to provide a context that, that shows why this prayer has already been fulfilled, everything in it, by Jesus Christ. And so he's the one that has done all this stuff. So I forgot where we left off, but I think uh, next we're leading into where Jesus uh, said in the prayer, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I know the Hebrews 9 talks a little bit about that. I don't know if you want to step into that part of it, Cap. Well, keeping in mind what we talked about last week with your will be done, and you just alluded to it, Joel, go to Hebrews chapter 10. That's what Jesus is trying to get these people to pray for, that the will of God regarding their redemption. Again, and not necessarily just the will of God for every little thing in your life or different various situations that take place in the world from day to day, but he was referring to the will of God being done through Christ, which Jesus came to do. On earth as it is in heaven, what does that mean? You know, when Jesus was sacrificed on the earth, he did not go into the replica tabernacle where the Jews worshipped, made by human hands, which was only a copy and shadow of the real thing. Hebrews 9, 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So we see where Jesus actually went into heaven at the time of the resurrection or, the, or shortly thereafter and into the perfect tabernacle before the presence of God himself, appearing on our behalf with a sacrifice that was now worthy of heaven. Not a copy, not a shadow, not like what the Jews would do with the high priests and, and the various sacrifices that would occur at the temple or in other places. This was the better sacrifice that would replace all of those other insufficient sacrifices. And it goes on a little bit further down in Hebrews 9. This is why the tabernacle, Hebrews 9.23, this is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. Right. 
like you were reading from uh, verse 23 there. And, and it, it, see, Hebrews really explains a lot of this stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, that's why I'm glad that we have done several podcasts where we have talked about what Hebrews says, because it explains so much. Just for example, if, if you're not really catching on to what we're saying in this podcast and in this series, I would really recommend reading Hebrews 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and you'll see so much of this stuff that happened under the ministry of Jesus, so many of the things that he talked about being fulfilled, such as this, like Hebrews 9, 23, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, like you were just saying, Cap, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So, your will be done. What was God's will? It was that Jesus become the sacrifice for mankind's sins. On earth, as it is in heaven, Jesus did this on earth. And as it says there in verse 23, what he did was a copy of the heavenly thing, <laughs> the heavenly things. I, I may not be able to explain it the best, but when you see this, that what Jesus did, Jesus didn't just die on the earth. He wasn't just sacrificed on the earth, but it says that what happened on the earth be done in heaven as well. And a couple minutes left or so, Cap, if you want to wrap things up. Yeah, let's try, Joel. Um, Hebrews 9, 24 through 26. Um, Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which is only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf, and he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth, who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. So uh, his sacrifice would not have to be repeated on the earth as it had previously with the Jewish high priests. They would be required to leave and then return again and again, do more of the same, and it never took away sin. So the will of God performed with this sacrifice on earth would satisfy the requirement in heaven by the everlasting removal of sins, which, by the way, would be remembered no more. So the will of God being done through Christ on earth as it is in heaven. See, Jesus had to be sacrificed on earth. He had to enter heaven on our behalf. This is tying into the Lord's Prayer. God, your will needs to be done. We're, we're in a hopeless situation under this covenant, and we need your king to come. We, we need your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus was instructing these people to do. And there's even some more fascinating things to get into here as we start talking about the bread and forgiveness and other things that have been accomplished for us that this prayer was seeking. So let's get into it uh, over the next several weeks, perhaps, right here on Growing in Grace. You'll find us, all of our past podcasts, at growingingrace.org. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. To access hundreds of past programs, visit graceroots.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.